It's not a secret that a lot of service designers struggle to get their concepts implemented. If you're one of them, keep watching because in this episode, we're going to look at what it takes to make service design real. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Lynn. This is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to design organizations that put people at the heart of their business. The guest in this episode is Lynn Wizard. I'm really excited to have Lynn on the show as she has both experience with service design consultancies, working at service design consultancies, and also in-house teams. So she knows the struggles from both sides. And one of the struggles is that for service designers, it's often challenging to make a work real, to actually get put services into the world that make an impact on customers and on business. Too often our work stays in the conceptual phase. So in this episode, we're going to explore some of the roadblocks, what is causing us not to be able to make our work real. And at the end of this episode, I hope that you have a different approach and mindset towards implementation, um, which might prove to be more effective. So that's what's coming up. If you enjoy these conversations, don't forget that we post at least one new video here on this channel that helps to level up your service design skills. So if you haven't done so already, click that subscribe button and of course that bell icon so you'll be notified when new videos come out. So that's all for the intro and now let's quickly jump into the interview with Lynn. Welcome to the show, Lynn. Hi, Mark. So stoked to be here. Awesome. Uh, Lynn, for the people who don't know who you are, could you give us a short introduction? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm Lynn and I'm an independent service designer based in Toronto. Uh, prior to going independent, I worked at uh, consulting companies like Bridgeable uh, and before that Usability Matters. So I uh, have been in Toronto for about seven years and it's been really interesting to see the service design community grow in that time. It's booming in uh, Canada at this moment. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, it's come such a long way since I first came here and, and folks really didn't know when I said, uh, I want to be a service designer. Uh, people hadn't really heard of it. Well, a lot a lot can happen. That That's probably encouraging for people who are watching or listening and are in a country where they feel that they are the only service designer around. It, it can change. Yeah, for sure. And actually, I think it can be a really great opportunity to roll up your sleeves and build the community and practice that you want. Of course, that can exactly. be tough, but also fun. Somebody has to do the work. I Just as a side note, I, somebody reached out to me on LinkedIn today and said, I want to organize the uh, Global Service Jam in uh, the Czech Republic. And I said, yeah, amazing, do it. Like that's the way to start, to start. Yeah, 100%. So, uh, the Global Service Jam is coming up in uh, March, I think. So uh, this is a quick shout out for the people who still want to join. Uh, maybe we'll do a special on that. Anyway, we're getting off track already and this is just to start. Lynn, uh, the question I ask everyone, how did you get in touch with service design? Do you recall the moment? I do. Uh, so it was 2008, 2009. I was studying uh, industrial design, my undergrad in Dublin at the National College of Art and Design. And we were doing uh, the Royal Society of Arts issues student design briefs every year. And I was really curious about a brief that was around redesigning the prison visit experience. Wow. This was mm. kind of outside Intense. maybe of, yeah. yeah, and kind of outside of the industrial design domain in a sense. But I was really compelled by this. And as I tried to do this project and tackle this brief, that was how I came across service design as I was trying to explore, you know, how can I express an experience that happens over time? How can I explore the different people and roles uh, that make this experience happen? Mm. Um, so that was my first, you know, I made my first very rudimentary journey map. Uh, the proposal I made was for redesigning a role within the prison system. Uh, and that was my first exposure to service design. Mm. Mm. 
2008, yeah. And uh, 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 Scotland also sort of has a... You know, I'm talking about Scotland, but you mentioned Dublin, but sort of that area uh, also has a heritage in service design, right? There, uh, sort of, I feel that a lot of people coming into service design sort of have their roots in that area. You mean that part of the world or...? Yeah, yeah. Of course, the UK, but also Scotland and Dublin. A lot, a lot has happened there. For sure, for sure. I mean, I remember um, shortly after I graduated, Lauren Curry, who was, you know, one of the founders of Snook, uh, came and gave a talk as part of a project hmm. I was doing. And so for sure, I think there was a really interesting kind of nascent exploration happening at that time. And some people like uh, Lauren and Sarah Drummond, of course, who were pioneering service design work, which I found really inspiring and exciting. Both were on the show, by the way, as well as Mike Press and a lot of people from that area. Cool. Happy. Uh, interesting to hear that. The present experience. I don't think I've uh, I've heard that one before. Uh, Lynn, let's get into the topics uh, you shared with me. Let's do interview jazz. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Okay. Um, I don't know if you had a particular order. Um should I surprise you or do you want them in the order that you gave me? Let's do them in the order I gave okay. you because I'm, uh, I'm hoping we'll have a nice flow. Okay. Okay. I'll be, um, uh, <clears throat> let's see, let's see what <laughs> comes out. Okay. So the first topic that we have over here, drum roll is make it real. And do you have the famous service design show question starters? Yes. So the question starter for this one, uh, why? Is it that we seem to have a really hard time making it real in service design or, or shipping service design is another way I've been thinking about okay. it. Please share what is your vision of shipping service design, making it real? What does that mean? Yeah, so I think for me, it's about, is there some kind of meaningful or visible or measurable change that we can draw a line from our work, our process, what we did, um, kind of to that change. So sometimes I think about it, did something in the market change? Did a service, is there a new service? Did a touch point of a service change? Um, is the way a service is being delivered, has that changed? Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is one of the things we grapple with is even first of all, understanding or defining what making it real means. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so I've in my career sir, as a service designer often got the question like, uh, okay, so can you, uh, tell me about a service that you actually designed? Like, can you point to a service that you actually created? And often the answer is, well, not really. And our clients don't really want a new service just as they might want a new website or an app or something like that. Right. That's, that's, that's already quite paradoxical. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's really, really unusual to be brought in to conceive of or deliver or build or design a service from scratch. I think it's much more common that we're working with something that's existing. Um, I think notionally people want improvement or change to what's existing. And then I think what happens is the reality of making that change happen is really, really difficult. And sometimes as service designers, we're not equipped, I think, to do that. Um, I was reading a bit uh, in preparation to chat with you. Um, there was a 10th anniversary edition of Touchpoint, which was focused on this issue from design to implementation. And there's a statistic quoted in there that only 4% of service design methods are, are focused on the implementation piece. Hmm. So I think that's a really interesting clue um, around where our energy has been focused from a methodology perspective. Yeah, but I, I feel that we, I, I've heard that statistic before and for people who don't know what Touchpoint is, it's a service design network magazine. It's a publication they, I think, publish every month or something like that, every quarter. I don't know. Anyway, I think it's every quarter. Yeah, I'll put a link down in the show notes. But what we have to define, like, what does it mean to implement service design? Because if we say 4% is focused on implementation, like, what is it focused at? Do you mm -hmm. have what, what is your perspective on that? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So again, I kind of go back to did something actually change, hmm. you know, in the service that a, a user, a customer, a citizen is experiencing, you know, did it make it out into the real world in some way? And that's the way I've been trying to kind of think about it for myself and in my own practice. Is this going to meaningfully change what's happening in the real world on a day to day basis? Is someone going to be able to experience that? Right. I, I think, you know, too often, which which is probably to do with the maturity level of the practice. But I think a lot of the time service design is being brought in to sort of do art of the possible or blue sky. And there's often a tension between wanting to do these very bold, visionary, you know, innovation type projects. Um, and there's a tension between that and what's actually realistic in terms of delivery and what it takes to do that delivery on a day to day basis. Mm. So this is something I've definitely been grappling with. And I think there's some dialogue in the community about, you know, work ending up on the concept shelf or in a drawer or you do all this work and it's a, a blueprint on the wall, but that's it. Yeah. And, and it's a waste of effort. It's a waste of energy. And it, it's uh, if we keep doing that kind of work, we're sort of putting the reputation of the whole industry on the line, right? Yeah, and I think part of it is about what are the conditions that you're walking into? Is an organization actually ready to make change? Um, do you have whether it's, you know, senior level executive champions or are you able to build the right relationships in such a way that people are brought along? And I think, you know, we talk a lot about co-creation um, being a way to do that. Uh, but I think something that happens a lot is that co-creation gets mixed up with uh, consensus based decision making. Mm -hmm. So people think that co-creation is going to solve all of the difficult decision making issues that mm. people and organizations are facing, um, whereas actually, it, you know, it can be a really powerful way to bring people along on the journey, but someone still ultimately needs to make decisions or there needs to be a process or structure in place for that decision making to happen. I think a lot of the time, uh, you know, concepts or service design projects flounder because that structure isn't really there to enable them to continue or to live on. And a lot of that's, you know, political or relational. So can we, well, yeah. And and then if we reflect that question back onto us, if it's political or related, can we actually influence that? I think so. Um, okay. I think we can influence it. I think one of the big challenges for designers is to reconsider or reconceptualize how much control we have. So I'm really interested in this idea that as designers who are often, you know, creative people, we're used to having a certain level of direct control over making things, right. um, whether that's being able to sketch or whether it's being able to make with your hands. You know, we're often kind of makers by nature. Uh, but I think what happens when you start working at something that's at the complexity level of a service, um, we can no longer have that direct control. The kind of material that we're working with, we'll maybe touch on this a bit more later. We will, uh, but yeah. But the material that we're working with um, is no longer sort of as malleable or as directly controllable. So I think influence is exactly the right word. We can have influence, but we may not be able to directly control the outcomes. And and, and that's maybe the frustrating thing, right? We We can sort of shape the conditions in which this outcome might occur, but we cannot enforce it. A hundred percent. And I think this is very difficult for folks who are maybe traditionally design trained like myself, because you're you're setting the expectation that you're going to have a vision that you then go execute on. So as an industrial designer, you know, you're going to bring this chair to life. Um, and I think it is a really different mindset to work at this level of complexity. And I think it's often what's very frustrating for people because there are people who are incredibly skilled at the craft elements but keep running into this frustration, like myself included, around why are we not delivering? Why is change not happening in the way mm. I was hoping? Why are we not making it real? Why am I struggling to be part of projects that that ship? Hmm. Hmm. I, I think we should transition into the second uh, topic because um, this will sort of be the red thread. What, what is it? The red line, red thread? What a 
What, yeah, what red it? thread. Red thread throughout the episode. Uh, so yeah, let's move into uh, topic number two to continue this conversation. And topic number two is about outcomes. Okay. Let me see here. So for this one, I thought we could use this question starter, which is how can we, mm -hmm. how can we expand our understanding of what the outcomes of service design are? Are, are, is our current understanding limited? So I think two things, I think one, we actually don't talk a lot about outcomes at all, which mm. is really interesting. Um, this became a little bit of an obsession for me uh, last year. I was really trying to explore this, this idea of how do we think about the outcomes of our work. Uh, so I think one is we're not really even having that much dialogue or discussion around outcomes. We're not framing our work around outcomes. Um, and then two, I think when we do, uh, it often gets a little bit maybe sidetracked or kind of dominated uh, with a conversation around metrics and KPIs and measurement. Mm. So I think we can unpack both of those a little bit more. Let's go. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. So I think the first piece around, you know, how are we framing our work? Are we actually talking about outcomes? I think as service designers, we love to talk about method, process, deliverables. Um, and actually, none of those things are really outcomes. They can lead to outcomes, but they're not outcomes in and of themselves. And I think historically what's happened is we've asked a lot of our uh, stakeholders and teammates and people we work with to sort of assess the quality of design um, and almost think about what the outcomes will be through the lens of these deliverables that we're creating. You know, there's a lot of conversation about we're not sort of speaking always the same language as the people we mm -hmm. work with. Uh, and so I think there's a really exciting opportunity to explore more about like what are the outcomes we're actually getting at. And I think what becomes very difficult, particularly in service design, is that a lot of these outcomes are very intangible. Um, so it might be things like convening new relationships or building new capability or skill or enabling people to solve problems with another tool set. Sure. It may also be things like increased value in some sense for the business, or it may be things like a, a new or mm -hmm. improved service being delivered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, and there are a lot of other things that also come uh, to my mind as an, uh, uh, an outcome. But the problem is, I think uh, we as a community don't make that uh, explicit. But it's also our clients are not per se asking and I sort of don't make the connection that if we have this kind of challenge, then it's a service designer that we need to call. I think that's true. Um, and I think for me, it comes back to how are we framing what we do? And mm -hmm. it's so it's so easy to get caught up in, you know, I love the design community. I love design. It's so easy to get caught up in our own little bubble. Uh, and so you know, if we're not effectively communicating the types of outcomes we can help to achieve, if we're not even having a dialogue about the types of outcomes of service design, how can we expect people to know exactly. that's something that a service designer can help with? Yeah. So uh, we, we've we've had had this conversation on the show quite often that we're we're so in love with what we do uh, that we love to talk about what we do rather than talking about the things we try to achieve, the outcomes we try to achieve for people. And if they're interested, we can talk about how we do it, but that shouldn't, in a, it should be more, uh, there should be a better balance. Let, let me phrase it that way, right? Yeah, for sure. And then I think the other piece becomes, how do we not get too caught up in this conversation around KPIs and return on investment? Uh, I think the big aha for me was thinking about the fact that often measurement is really a proxy for outcomes. So, you know, for example, if you want to get healthier, maybe one of the things you're going to measure is say what you weigh or BMI could be, it doesn't have to be. Um, but really that number is not the outcome you want. The outcome is maybe to feel better, to be able to 
you know, sure. run for the bus or yep. whatever it is. And I think sometimes we get a bit mixed up because we feel so pulled by the really dominant uh, kind of business values around being able to prove ROI and metrics and so on. And so I think they have a place and they can be a helpful way of showing something changed uh, because of the work we did. I think we need to be careful not to get too sucked into thinking that this is the only way to kind of demonstrate outcomes of service design. And I think there are a lot of intangible outcomes to the work we do, which is around how people feel. Um, so a little story about a project I did last year um, with a public sector client. You know, I, I think one of the things that was most exciting for me was seeing how some of the frontline staff who were really tenured, experienced, very skilled people in their jobs you could see a sort of renewed sense of excitement and energy at being brought into a different way of doing things. And mm -hmm. it's very hard to measure, um, but I think it's quite a meaningful outcome. And and um, I, I totally agree, by the way, with you. Uh, how, but how, my question would be, how can we, uh, I sort of feel that we have to convince clients that these are actually meaningful outcomes. How, in any any mm -hmm. in, do you have the same experience and if so how do we do that or, or or yeah yeah no i think it's true and i think i think one thing is you know you don't want to necessarily lead with some of the things that may seem different or or kind of too out there um but i do believe that a lot of it is about what are you modeling when you show up Mm -hmm. what, what does it feel like to work with you or, mm -hmm. or your or the team? Um, so I, I kind of feel that a lot of this is a bit of a show don't tell. It's more about the experience of doing the work together than it is about trying to convince or sell or tell uh, that these things matter. I think people can feel when it's happening and they and they sort of, you know, I, I sort of framed it like this in uh, the talk I gave about this last year. I sort of said, you know, how do you know that you're in love, right? Um, it's very intangible. It's very much about a feeling. Uh, and I think it's less about convincing people that these things matter because I think we know it as people and it's more about letting people experience it. Hmm. Again, again, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm totally on your side. The challenge the, the I sort of the challenge, one of the challenges that I see is when you deliver outcomes that you know are valuable, but your client isn't per se valuing, then sort of the perception of the value of your work isn't what it should be. So, right? We, we can create a lot of valuable outcomes like shared understanding or uh, renewed energy. But if somebody upfront isn't looking for that, or it's like they, they don't know what they don't know, then <clears throat> we have created a lot of value, but we sh I don't know what the word is, but we should be appreciated for that or credited for that or. So I might kind of challenge you there, Mark, Good. and say Please that, do. you know, um, are we in it to be appreciated, right? And I think this comes a little bit mm -hmm. back to this idea of sort of what are we expecting out of the work and what type of, of humility can we bring to the practice? And can we really be in service of in a way that is sort of, you know, not attached to necessarily getting credit or uh, feeling valued or all of these things. I mean, I understand that there are some, you know, realities around business and uh, it's not to diminish that. But I think there's something really interesting for designers around how can we cultivate a mindset that really is about being of service mm -hmm. and acknowledging that if if a team or a client doesn't feel that some of these things are valuable outcomes or they're, they're not seeking that right now, then, you know, they're not in a place where that's meaningful to them or it's the right thing for them or maybe they're sort of not almost ready in a sense and I think this is a lot to do with um, having patience in terms of what the change we're often seeking is a long game not a short game yeah so and, and that's again a recurring theme in the last few episodes is um, it's also about finding the right clients having the skill to find not, not every client or challenge or project is suited for a service design approach. 
A hundred percent. And I think for designers, and I'm trying to work on this for myself, it's also about readjusting your expectations about how much change can happen, how fast, hmm. um, and, and what's actually realistic for people. You know, sometimes you go into a project, you think it's one thing, you think it's going to be about this, you know, I don't know, big yeah. radical service innovation. And, you know, it turns out that actually, if you could support people to see the value in, in qualitative research, that would actually be a good outcome for that, whatever it is, you know, mm -hmm. four months, six months. Um, and those moments, I think you have to really celebrate. I had uh, a client last year after, you know, some resistance to the idea of prototyping and testing and, you know, just sort of not super excited about this idea. And we set up and did some prototyping and testing with folks and the team was so excited. And I had someone say to me, I'm never doing anything again without testing mm -hmm. it with the people who will use it. And that's huge. Like that's an amazing outcome, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we have to sort of be really uh, aware that what comes natural to us m might not come natural to other people. And then celebrating that, putting that on a stage, if you will, is really important. Exactly. And I think we sometimes expect too much too quickly. Mm -hmm. So taking those moments, which can seem maybe small and maybe weren't the thing that we thought we were going to be able to achieve at the outset and actually really celebrating those for what they are. I'm yeah. really excited yeah. by these ideas. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. We're going to continue transition into the third and final topic, shall we? Let's do it. Okay. It's again, one word, which is in this case material. Okay, let me get my question starter here. Okay, so I think my question here is, what if mm -hmm. the material of service design is the organization? That's an interesting thought. Please elaborate. Okay, so this idea of the material of service design is the organization comes from Stephen Taylor at Harmonic Design. Uh, he wrote a Medium post about it, I think last year. Um, and I found this really fascinating. So we were talking a bit earlier about, you know, designers often learn a craft, learn how to work with some kind of material. And this really resonated for me around as service designers, the material we're working with is the organization. I, and yeah, in, yeah. yeah. And in order to kind of achieve the types of outcomes that we want, we need to be really skilled actually at working with this material and yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So I think there's also a very interesting tension. I'm, I'm maybe preempting uh, maybe something or I was listening a bit to some of the previous episodes and I know this has been kind of talked about in, in various ways. You know, I think one of the questions that might arise is, is this too big of a scope? Like, is it really our job to take on the organization? Um, and I understand that at the same time, I would sort of say that we can't be effective as service designers without considering the organization and without actually getting skilled at working with organizations and the sort of material they're in. Um, and I think that's why we're often struggling to make it real and mm. to ship service design because mm. we're not that skilled or that equipped um, or we're not calibrated in the right way to work with that material. Mm. I. Um... I think I, I have a video also on the channel where I talk about uh, that one that the design material for service design is the organization and you have to understand the uh, material properties just like in any design discipline. Another way we could also look at this is if we as service designers are sort of writing the software, the hardware is the organization that our software needs to run upon. And if we want to make software that actually runs without bugs, we need to understand the platform sort of that we're building this on top of, right? That's that's sort of the metaphor I'm using in my head. Yeah, that's a great metaphor. Hmm. What are um, so so what what is it that we actually need to do if the organization is at the design material? How do we design with the organization? Yeah, great question, and definitely not something that's straightforward, right? Um, one of the things that was a bit of a light bulb moment for me. I was coming across 
some work by Lotta Ron during her PhD and she she was looking at basically organizational theory. And this was kind of a light bulb for me. So the idea is that we often think about organizations in a very mechanistic kind of systems oriented way. And we think that we're gonna achieve outcomes by implementing a plan. Um, it's sort of a system and we can have a plan and implement it. And we hope to get this one is to one result where our plan and the outcome are very closely interlinked. Mm -hmm. And kind of side note, historically, we've seen the quality of a design process as connected to how um, closely matched the actualized design or the product that goes to market is to the sort of design vision. Mm -hmm. That's been an indicator of the quality of the process. We're able to execute on that. And what Lotta's PhD talks about is that the in part, is that the latest in organizational theory suggests that we should actually be thinking about organizations as conversations, where outcomes happen by coming in and affecting and changing the conversations that are happening. So this was really interesting to me because I was like, oh, yes, I have thought that I can just go in and have a plan and sort of implement it and get this outcome or result, but actually, when you think about organizations as conversations, two things happen. One, we can think about a lot of the design process and design work and design methods as a way of having new conversations or shaping or changing the conversations, and also as sort of an invitation to have a different conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And two, just by being there, we're actually changing the conversation. And so in this model, you can kind of argue that we're implementing simply by being there and changing the conversation. I struggle a little bit with this because it feels like a tautology to me, right? Then the so, question, yeah. Yeah. So, so then the question for me becomes if by showing up and being part of it and changing the conversation, I'm already implementing, I'm already creating new outcomes. How do we make sure those are intended outcomes, hmm. that, that those are intentional? Mm -hmm. hmm. Again, I'm going to I reference a video that I made is um, where I said there is no implementa impl implementation in service design. Everything is implementation from the first moment you start interacting with your, your client and that, that uh, stirred up some debate, but it was exactly to sort of counter the notion that we can sort of go through research, uh, ideation, prototyping, and then sort of implement. I've never seen that work in, in any organization. So the implementation mindset, I like the way you phrased it, it uh, of having a conversation from day one, and then how do you make it intentional? That's about direction and, and other stuff, right? Yeah, and I think this goes back to what we touched on a bit earlier, which is how can we expand what we think of as outcomes? So new conversations are in fact an outcome. Um, convening new relationships are an outcome. They may be less tangible outcomes. They may be harder to prove the value of. They are how change happens. Hmm. So how do, uh, should we start adopting a, a new mental model around service design and it, should we start having a different conversation about service design so to add to that do we have like still the industrial design lens on service design and should we adopt a, maybe a different lens i don't know which one yet but question mark yeah quite possibly i think that Many of the ways that we operate uh, are really rooted in industrial models of the world. And you see that now with organizations, in some cases, struggling to stay relevant and adaptable. We've been very used to, you know, top down types of control and hierarchy. And now we're living in a world that's much more flexible and networked. Um, and where things are much more emergent. Mm. And I, I think for designers, we're sometimes still quite rooted in that industrialized model, which makes sense. That's where our practice has its origins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and if we go back to one of the things we said in the beginning of the episode, where 4% of the 
methods is focused on implementation. This could also sort of uh, relate to that where the methods of implementation are focused on product delivery or the product mindset or industrial design mindset. While we might start, we might need to build a vocabulary and a tool set of methods that originates more from a service delivery lens. A hundred percent. And I, I think for me, a lot of what this comes back to is where does service design live in this? And it comes a bit to where do you sit in the organization? Um, you know, and there's arguments to be made for all sorts of different setups. Um, but I think we need to be really strategic about how work happens. And what you said reminds me of this sort of thought around operations. I mean, operations is in some ways, to my mind, the kind of oldest form of service design we have. Uh, it's how things get done and how things happen in organization and how, how things are delivered. And so I think there's a really natural relationship between service design um, and operations, for example. Um, yeah. So, so to continue on, on what you said, what would be the place for service design? Yeah, I think it's a tough one. And I think we're still trying to figure that out. I think there's a question about, um, you know, what should our role be, right? Should we be embedded practitioners within delivery teams, um, you know, within product or service lines? Um, and of course, there's lots of great sort of exploration around this. Um, What's it called? Design Ops for Design Orgs? Or yeah, uh, good yeah, work. or yeah. I'm yeah. not sure if I'm getting that title entirely correct, but um, so there's there's lots of different sort of conversation around where we should sit, uh, and there's pros and cons to to either. I think unless we're sitting close to or have insight into how things are getting delivered and shipped we're not likely to be able to really trace our work mm. to that end outcome in a very linear way, which sometimes might be okay. But I think what starts to happen with service design is by nature, it's so complex, cross-functional. There's so many different people involved. It's much harder to have a really tight two pizza team that is responsible for delivering and shipping a service. And I think that's one of the things we need to really grapple with. Um, Lynn, regarding what we've just talked about in the last uh, 30 minutes, is there a question that you would like to ask us, the viewers and the listeners of the show? I do have a question. Um, it's not necessarily directly related to everything we've been talking about. Um, but I'm curious to hear if any of the listeners have great examples either that they've worked on or they've come across of how organizations have started to kind of root, routinize or have as part of their ongoing practice um, service sort of testing and service simulation. So, you know, very aware of all the sorts of methods that you'll come across in lots of the books, but curious whether there's examples of service organizations in particular, building that into part of their practice and how they're actually continually testing, um, prototyping and testing services uh, in their delivery process. Um, and not just from a digital perspective, but exactly. from a, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I, I already see the comments flowing in that people do uh, MVPs and screen A, A B testing, stuff like that. That's not yeah. what we're aiming at, right? That's not quite what I'm aiming at. I'm aiming at like, how do you actually prototype and test on an ongoing basis, uh, very complex omni-channel services that happen over time? And is are there any great examples of organizations that have built some capacity or maturity in continually doing that type of testing in their service delivery. It would I'm be very awesome. Curious. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Bring I feel it like on. It's a bit of a new frontier. New frontier. Uh, I'll, I'll make sure to also add this question in the uh, email that I send out to uh, to the community. Lynn, final question. What's the best way to get in touch with you if people want to reach out? Yeah, uh, I'm fairly active on Twitter usually. Uh, my handle is at Witster, W-I-T-T-S. T E R. 
I think we'll link to it. it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's an anagram of Twitter's. There you go. <laughs> okay. Twitter, anything else? Uh, people can feel free to connect on LinkedIn and you can always drop me an email. Uh, my name's fairly unique and fairly Googleable, so you probably you'll probably get me. <laughs> Good. Well, uh, there was a lot to process in the uh, coming two weeks before the next episode comes out. So, uh, <laughs> Link, uh, thanks for stirring this up. Yeah, you're welcome, Mark. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thanks. So coming back to Lynn's question, do you have any examples of companies who are able to continuously prototype and test services? We would love to hear some examples. Leave your thoughts, ideas in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this episode, consider sharing it with at least one other person today. That way you'll not only help to grow the service design community, but you'll also help me to invite more inspiring guests like Lynn. If you would like to see more interesting videos, more interviews with service design pioneers, here's the next video. So check that out and I'll see you over there.